Amy Wagner. I'm the literary director here at Actors Theater, um, and I'd like to. After Theater's 50th anniversary. Um, and uh, thanks so much for joining us for this conversation, which is titled The Art of Collective Invention. Um, I have a couple quick announcements I just want to make before we get started. Um, this event is live, live streaming on HowlRound TV, so hello to folks who may be watching us from afar. Um, you can follow the conversation on Twitter at ATRouble using the hashtag Humanifest. Um, and there'll be an opportunity for questions a little bit later on uh, in the conversation. If you have something to say, please raise your hand and wait for someone to run a microphone to you so that we can make sure we can hear you in this arena and also folks out in the cyberspace can hear what you have to say. Um, so with those logistics out of the way, um, this conversation uh, features members of five very different ensemble-based uh, theater companies talking about their work. Um, and you'll meet them in a moment, but I'd just like to introduce the person who is going to guide us through this dialogue for the next 55 minutes or so, um, Lila Neugebauer, right on the end there. Um, <laughs> um, so Lila is a New York-based director. She's the director of Dorothy Fort Berry's Play Partners in this festival. Um, and she recently has directed new plays all over the country. Um, she's uh, this season, she received a Princess Grace Fellowship Award in partnership with Actors Theatre, and so she's been around uh, in our artistic community for quite a while. And most importantly for this conversation, she is a co-artistic director of The Mad Ones, um, which is an ensemble dedicated to devising visceral and highly detailed theatrical experiences that investigate cultural memory and nostalgia. So I'll turn this over to you, Lila, now. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm so delighted to be here uh, with this particular group of people. And um, before I ask you to introduce yourselves, um, I, I guess I just want to acknowledge as context that it's, um, I just, uh, it feels uh, appropriate and wonderful to be having this conversation in this particular room. Um, uh, you know, this institution has supported this kind of work for a number of years, for many years. Um, and um, I actually have seen the work of all of these companies in this building. Um, this beautiful city from the civilians, I want to say is Humana 08, 08. Yeah. I just saw the hypocrites, Pirates of Penzance in this very room this winter. Um, uh, city Company has a, has a long and rich history in this building, uh, most recently, currently, Steel Hammer and prior to that under construction. Um, and uh, the moving company will have a show here next fall, right? But I also just learned that Fishers, which I saw at Humana 09, 10, 10. Um, uh, was the beginning of the moving company. Um, so that is just to say, I think this is an excellent room in which to be having this conversation. Um, so I would love to invite our panelists to introduce themselves, and can you tell us your name and the company you're here representing? And maybe as a kind of contextualizing snapshot, could you tell us a bit about maybe what your company is working on right now? I'll start. Uh, I'm Nathan Keepers. And I am Associate Artistic Director of The Moving Company out in Minneapolis, which is a bit of an offshoot of Theatre de la Jeune Lune. Um, and I uh, co-run the company with Dominique Saran and Steve Epp. And uh, currently, we are working on a uh, production of Lost Labor's Lost that we are going to bring here to Actors Theatre next fall. And uh, going out to California to do Tartuffe at South Coast Rail. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. I'm Colleen Worthman, and I'm here representing the civilians, and we are doing a show called The Great Immensity, which is a musical about climate change, <laughs> uh, at the public starting April 11th. Hi, I'm Helena Kate. I'm uh, here from Chicago, representing the hypocrites, and uh, we will start rehearsing um, an adaptation of all 32 surviving Greek tragedies, which will culminate in a 12-hour uh, long event play. <laughs> Uh, opening in August, food and drink provided. <laughs> uh, I also am an associate artist with the Neo Futures there, and a member of the Ruffian, so I create sort of ensemble-based work in all three of those arenas. Hi, everybody. I'm Barney O'Hanlon. I'm with the uh, Ambogard City Company, and we are here in the festival doing a new piece called Steel Hammer. 
And shortly after that, we'll be doing Aeschylus's The Persians at the Getty Villa in LA. Um, and I just want to out Colleen because she's a member also of a company that I love called Elevator Repair Service. Yes, that's true. <laughs> the arts. Um, uh, so I guess uh, before we maybe jump into talking about the work, uh, also to contextualize for this room for people who are maybe more or less familiar with your companies, I I'd love to also just hear you talk a bit about um, how the company started, um, what the genesis was, um, or, or maybe how you started working with the company, and also um, what constitutes the company in terms of how many people? Um, is it a small resident company? Is it a group of rotating artists? Anything in there? And also, how long has the company been in existence? Do I have to start again? Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, uh, <laughs> I have to start. Uh, that, that it's, let's see. Well, the moving company is about four years old, I think. Um, but I've been working with Dominique and Steve. We've been working together for about 16 years. Um, Dominique is one of the founders of Jean Loon, um, and Steve was there for about 25 years. So they've been working together for about 30 years. Um, and what was the other part of your question? Mm -hmm. What constitutes the company? Oh, what constitutes the company? The moving company is, the artistic core is myself, Dominique, and Steve. Um, and then uh, Christina Baldwin is a singer who we work with quite a bit. Um, and then we kind of, we kind of pull here and there, but the core is Dominique and Steve. How did we start? Because uh, Jean Lin closed in spring 2008, and we needed to keep working. So, <laughs> that's the long and the short of it. <laughs> okay, so uh, the civilians have been around since 2001. Started by Steve Kossin. He had gone to UC San Diego uh, and was a director there, and worked in San Francisco for a couple of years. Then he came to New York, and I met him doing a workshop of a play by Ann Washburn called The Communist Dracula Pageant, which was done a few years ago at ART. And while we were doing that very, very early workshop of it, he told me that he had this idea to start uh, a theater company that used real life as its springboard, but was also really fun and entertaining and had songs. And I said, well, hey, sign me up. So <laughs> that's how I started with the company. And now the civilians are a loose configuration of about 75 people. Not everybody works on every single project. It's sort of on a it's cost for come in, come out, work on a thing, get the hell out, you know. <laughs> but yeah, so they're, they're all the company managers, or, uh, the company members are, you know, actors, designers, stage managers, directors, playwrights, everybody. Uh, the Hypocrite started in 1997 in the basement of a vegan coffee shop where we did a Ionesco play. I wasn't part of it, but I accidentally saw it, and then that changed my life. We started as a, a company that mostly did absurdist work, and um, over time moved into adaptations and new work as uh, the artist's interest grew. And we're a loose, uh, we have company members named, but uh, we sort of call it a group of admiring artists. There aren't a lot of uh, set responsibilities in that realm, but we just tend to always work together, so we made that into a company of designers, performers, writers, and directors. About uh, less than 20. Yeah. City Company has been around for 22 years now. Uh, I've been a member for about 20 of its 22 years. It was formed um, as an agreement between a Japanese, amazing Japanese theater director named uh, Suzuki Tadashi and Aaron Bogart. He has a company in Togamora, Japan, which is a small uh, farming village up in the mountains. And he wanted to create uh, something similar to his company in the States. And there were a lot of um, American actors um, <coughs> who had been doing the Suzuki training and would go over to Toga to train with their company. And uh, <coughs> so eventually what happened was uh, the late great Peter Zeisler brought Anne and a few people out sort of as an audition. And um, Suzuki and Anne hit it off and they started the company uh, up in Saratoga Springs one summer and uh, we kept it alive during the year. And Suzuki funded us pretty much for our first five years and then s said, okay, I'm done, it's yours. And so we're still here. God bless us. Um, <coughs> I, I want to talk about process and how these companies create works. So um, 
I'm curious to hear each of you give us a sense of um, what a kind of typical incubation period looks like for a new piece, and that um, might include, but feel free to answer whatever part of this is most interesting to you. Um, how does a piece start? Where does it start? With what kind of a thing does it start, and who usually brings that idea in? And then, um, what are the practices or mechanisms or methods through which you create material? And then, how does that generated material evolve into a production? Turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> um, do I have to start again? No, no, no. <laughs> Whoever wants to start, chaos. Yes. I'll start. Right now. So, uh, a typical civilian's process will start with. Uh, an idea that either somebody in the company has had, or most of the time, an idea that Steve Kosson has had, because he's very, very much is the artistic leader of the company. Um, and we will try to find and interview as many people related to that idea as we possibly can. For example, this beautiful city, which was done here, uh, came out of a, a company meeting where we were trying to figure out what to do next, and we um, we spent a weekend together talking about things that we really cared about and didn't understand and wanted to know more about, and it turned out to be about beliefs, especially regarding right-wing Christianity. So <coughs> through that, we started investigating evangelical churches and focused on Colorado Springs as sort of the epicenter of um, the, the right-wing evangelical Christian movement, and then went out there to meet people, and while the company was out there interviewing people, the whole Ted Haggard thing exploded. And so that was awesome. <laughs> In terms of a, you know, a narrative uh, event for the show. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, interviewing people in the Air Force, people uh, in alternate groups around town. So, And th we've also worked with playwrights where maybe they'll use some civilian actors to generate material and then go away and work on that. So, in a certain way, the playwright becomes the journalist and the actors become the subjects. And what we, what we say becomes what they work with. That was the case of this play that Anne Washburn just did at Playwrights Horizons that was directed by Steve. It was called Mr. Burns. And um, almost the entire first act of that three-act play was based on conversations that happened in the room. Verbatim. Yeah, I mean, edited to be called from a verbatim text. Indeed. Yeah, carefully, carefully called. Carefully and lovingly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds a little similar in that um, it's an annoying answer because it depends on the product that we're looking to make sure. or the, the piece itself. The hypocrites are interesting in that way. It's almost always director led in that. A director has an idea or a show that we want a, that a particular person wants to do, and then whoever that personality is ends up leading the type of process. So when Sean Grady, who directed Pirates here, wanted to start adapting those uh, Gilbert and Sullivan shows, he had a really specific goal in mind and drew in talent and, and people to collaborate with him that were specific to that, so people could play their own instruments, rearrange the music singers, dancers, you know, athletes in that way to come in and collaborate on that process. But <coughs> when I was interested in creating a new adaptation for Six Characters in Search of an Author, that was a little bit more of a some actor-based verbatim adaptation based on our company and some just playwright writing a play the way a sort of more traditional new play develops. And then another show that I worked on was based on a historical fact. The idea came from the playwright. Then we brought in a group of, of clowns to help us make the physical part of it. But then ultimately that material created in the room was handed back to a playwright to adapt, edit, and form as a whole. So I think what's nice about being in a company, and the reason I think a lot of Chicago artists are company-based actors and writers and directors are because you have the freedom to change the form of how you want to make the piece based on what the piece wants to be. <coughs> Can I actually just a quick follow up? <laughs> the idea of um, it, using verbatim text from actors in conversation with six characters in search of an author, what did that mean? Like, what what um, what were the prompts for the, you know, how did you involve their text? Yeah, you know, Steve, who works here, was the one who did that adaptation for us. He's here somewhere. 
Um, he came uh, to Chicago, and uh, the I, I hired the actors who were the acting company of that play uh, way in advance, and he and we're friends of mine, and people we've all worked together. And he came up, and we gave them scenarios, and they improvised through uh, ideas, knowing some history of the hypocrites, because we said it, the hypocrites are here doing a remount of pirates again for the millionth time, and I, like that was the sort of joke of the premise. And so we played those games out and cast someone as the director and, and sort of just got to play in a room for a long time and their characters were their names so we didn't, there was some neo-futurist aesthetic in that. Where and Mr. Burns, our, our characters yeah. were our names as well. So it was like, it became a fun like psychological and philosophical issue because it was always their names and so it was them playing themselves in oh. these situations and then these characters coming in and then that was highly scripted when the mm -hmm. characters came in and but they were allowed to improvise within, uh, even during performances, within a certain set of rules. It was fun. You want to wrestle, Marty? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make mine quick. For the, for the most part, the ideas come from Anne Bogart, and then we make them. <laughs> because Anne's interest is changing. Um, she's really into collaborating with other artistic organizations right now. Um, so for example, Steel Hammer is a collaboration with the amazing music group Bang the Can, which we will eventually do live with them, performing live. Um, before that, it was a collaboration with the Bill T. Jones, uh, Bill T. Jones Art Museum Dance Company, and before that it was with the Martha Graham Dance Company. So she's heading in this direction and taking us along. Um, but in our other work, she has the idea, sometimes a year, sometimes two in advance, she reads a lot, just states on the material, and then brings the material to us. And usually we workshop the material with our um, students at our four-week summer intensive at Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs. And they do a lot of compositions or, or uh, devised short pieces based on the material. And we sort of get a sense of what the piece can or should not be. And then we'll, uh, we'll go into a typical rehearsal process, three or four weeks, and just work really quickly and put it up. I'm also just curious for you to name, <laughs> for, um, for, for people who are not familiar with your work, um, there, it's like um, if you have the privilege of getting to observe any part of a city process, they have one of the most rigorous practices, I think, in the American theater. Um, and um, uh, I'm just curious if you will just add sort of um, what, what some of those practices are. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, we train in the Suzuki method of actor training every day and also the viewpoints improvisation practice. And it's a part of who we are. It's a part of our DNA. It's how we get ready. It's how we spiritually, mentally, physically prepare ourselves to work. And you know, and it's not unlike dancers, you know, you have to do a class before you do your show. And similarly with musicians, you have to do your scales. And we thought, well, why should that be any different for actors? So if that's our, these are our scales or our ballet bar, if you will. Um, the Moving Company, it kind of, it's the same thing. It depends on the project. Um, and it's a, it sounds a little hokey, but at Jean Lun, we always said, we don't pick the plays, the plays pick us, or the project picks us. And there's a practical part of that, I think, which is, there's a bunch of ideas. You know, we all have a lot of ideas about what to do. And somehow, as we talk and say, oh, there's this, there's this, there's this, the one starts to tell us what, what we should do. We're like, that one seems right right now. We can go at that one. Or we feel like we need to go back and do something like that. So, um, a creation, for instance, something from scratch. We, sometimes we find that it's like, we haven't done that in a while. Let's just do something from scratch. We don't, and then we start to go on theme, on idea about what that could be, just so we can work that muscle again. Um, 
Recently, we just did a show uh, called Out of the Pan, Into the Fire, which is a fairy tale that we ended up writing um, from scratch. But when we originally went at it, we, said, we, we thought, let's go at the fairy tale and sort of investigate what the fairy tale is. And what we, we started with the Grimm stories, and we thought, oh, we'll just adapt those things and put them on their feet. Or we'll kind of improvise them up on their feet, and it's impossible. They don't live on their feet. They live on the page, you know what I mean? So we really found that you had to write it. We had to write it, and we couldn't improvise it either. It was something that felt like we had to do the research and sort of get the characters uh, pulled out from the stories of Grimm, and then create them ourselves, and by discussion, a lot of conceiving and discussion, and then going and saying, let's write this scene. And then we put it up on our feet, and it shifts and it changes, and we edit, and, and there's improvisation within that as well. But um, as opposed to a creation where you're just getting up on your feet, or an adaptation where you're deciding what the what part of the thing do you want to tell? What 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 um, what seeds from that book or that even that play do you want to like focus on? So that's my answer. I, I that just uh, made me think of a, a thing that is important in our company and the civilians that. Uh, I think is really cool and sort of private. The actors generally play the people they interview. And ideally, the actors are the people transcribing their, the interview. I mean, now, now we tend to use recording devices for a lot of different reasons. But um, in the beginning, we, we didn't. So we would just listen very carefully. This is similar to um, the joint stock, the British company that uh, Carol Churchill was involved in, and Les Waters, too. Um, where uh, you sort of go away, and what you remember the most is sort of what gets distilled into the truth of the character. And we go back in and play. We, we, we present to everybody in the rehearsal space. We'll play that person. That's sort of a monologue. And then people will ask questions to that character. And if you don't know the answer, you have to sort of just make it up. And that's where the really cool graft of actor and character first occurs. Um, and. I should add that in our company, uh, Michael Friedman, who is a fantastic composer, um, a brilliant incorporator of real life into music, he will often make whole songs out of verbatim transcripts. So there'll be, there's like, yeah, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to say. <laughs> um, and, and much more complex thoughts than that as well. <laughs> In our pre-panel chat, there's a threat of song, and um, <laughs> it's begun. Let's take right. that box. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm sorry, my very brief follow-up to that question that I meant to add is, um, I imagine it might vary, but how long does a piece typically take to make, or what's the range? I'll start. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Sometimes it's it's great. Great. we like to, you know, in an ideal world, we always say we love to have a year to make the work, right? But we never do. Um, and so I would say from first talking about it to actually putting up could be a year, but that's first talking about it and sort of, you know, throwing it out there. Could be a year to six months, I would say. That's the gestation period, probably. Some pieces of ours have been developed in as little as three weeks. Some have taken six years. Some, uh, it just sort of depends also on the institutional mojo. Yeah. If, if there's a company or a, a, an institution that's like, ooh, we want to work on that with you, then we sort of do like mini workshops building up to that full production. And do you, do you guys, uh, we do, um, do you go back and trouble the pieces and parts with them? Like revivals? Like remounting shows? Remounting shows and then significantly altering them? Um, yeah, we haven't, we haven't done that quite at the moving company yet. We did a Jalun. We opened up the show and then it wasn't doing well and we closed it and we reworked it and then we opened it again. Um, no, it didn't. It didn't really help us. But it felt kind of badass to do. But uh, we generally. Once they're up on their feet, we continue to tinker with them. Yeah, because yeah. you know there's that moment where you have to you have to get it in front of people, 
It doesn't matter where it's at, and you just have to. And then you need that information. And then once you have that information, you can you can go back and you can say, we're gonna, we're gonna remove that scene over here. We're gonna do that because tracking wise for the audience, they need that, you know what I mean? Um, so we, we tend to wanna get up on our feet and we honor the rehearsal time for what it is and for where it can get to and then we're like, we need an audience. We just have to have it and then usually we butts after that, butts after that. The Civilians, I don't think, has ever revived and significantly reworked a show. We, we have definitely done shows on tour, uh, Gone Missing, which I was a, one of the original people in, toured for like five years. And then we did an off-Broadway run for about eight months at the Barrow Street Theater in Manhattan. But uh, uh, my other company, Elevator Repair Service, um, has, has reworked shows significantly a number of times. We did this one called Language Instruction, which was about Andy Kaufman and the nature of his sort of manipulative style of comedy and his transgressiveness. Uh, we did one version of it in 94, and another version of it in 94, and then I think another version in 98, something like that. And that was a lot of fun. And now uh, the company's reviving its production of the, the Sound of the Fury, which we did at New York Theater Workshop a few years ago, and now I, I think is going to be reworked somewhat, or maybe not. It sort of depends on what John Collins, who is ERS's artistic director, wants to do. Yeah, for us, I think it's more that seeds of things grow into bigger things and then are completely reworked. So I was an actor in the first adaptation of Oedipus, which was about a three-person, maybe a little over an hour-long thing. And because that was so successful and so artistically interesting, that started our uh, uh, grainy moving forward and doing all of Sophocles, so that was like a six-hour night. Oedipus got reworked and snuck in there, a smaller sort of different version, and now we're on to this. So that process from beginning to end is something like six years, I guess, that something, an idea started and it keeps growing and growing, and then some ideas start and then they're done yeah. when they're done. Uh, <laughs> but similar, it's so hard to answer that question in a you know, short panel, but if we all get to hang out sometime and have a beer, you can talk about projects and how much time they take. And again, it is, what I feel like, what the project asks, which is the gift of being in a company versus being like hired to walk in and say, you have this amount of time to make this thing. Yeah. I think that's the freedom and I, probably why all of these companies make such unique things, because you have some freedom in that process mm -hmm. to uh, take some real time. To, to even ponder it or yeah. talk yeah. about it a lot yeah, or could, well, get maybe. people in a room to mess around without right. a product necessarily being the And then end it lives. Results. It starts to live. Yeah. And that's the pleasure of having a company or the, the work can live and live on its own. You don't you, it starts to be its own beast. Totally. <laughs> the good ideas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the bad ideas put them away. But um, that's the pleasure. Of, of working ensembles that you can, those pieces grow and they live and you just follow them around and live with them. Yeah. Um, I would love to talk a little bit about um, the dynamics of collaboration in your companies. Um, uh, bearing in mind, of course, as anyone in this room who makes work, that um, every room in which collaboration happens, no matter how purportedly traditional or non-traditional, um, is totally singular, based on the project and the human beings and the context. Um, uh, nonetheless, in a room in which there is a, maybe a less traditionally articulated hierarchy, maybe, um, or just a less traditionally structured environment, um, would you just talk a bit about um, how collaboration works, who has a say in what? <laughs> Everybody has a say in it, um, in our in our work. Um, even people who are just sitting watching rehearsal, just observing. <laughs> um, and ultimately, we, we function both as a company and uh, uh, when we make work um, through consensus. We try to work with consensus, and it's hard, and it can be hard one, but uh, it seems to work best for us to work that way. Um, a lot of ideas in the room, a lot, and that can be a pain in the neck. Um, you know, but ultimately we're all searching for the best answer, so that's really the goal. With the civilians, I've, I've sort of identified a pattern of um, 
we'll do like a, what we call sort of a slap up, where it'll be like a very, very raw version of a script that Steve has compiled from, um, you know, all the interviews that we've compiled. And, and the actors generally highlight things in the text which we think are amazing, or the transcribers will be like, oh my god, 24K gem right here. <laughs> and uh, so he'll call, I mean, it, it's insane, there'll be like 700 pages of stuff on, his, on Steve's desk and he'll have it all stacked in piles. Uh, so we'll do a wild, raw version, and usually it's full of life and really wild, and then he goes back into it and he gets very geeky, and there's, then there's a very well-behaved draft, which is very well-considered from all sides, and it's, it's a little dull, and then he freaks out, and then he adds whimsical <laughs> touches. <laughs> By this point, we're usually <laughs> on our feet, and then we go, Steve, why are you having us, you know, bat around balloons, or... <laughs> Uh, in this case of the show about the Atlantic Yards dribbling basketballs, which was my personal nightmare. <laughs> because I, I generally shun hand-eye coordination related, uh, you know, activities. But <laughs> that's why I did theater, right? <laughs> but it'll be like, well, because I have to lighten up this part. And so then, usually afterwards, we'll go and have a beer, and he'll be like, I don't like this part. And we'll be like, well, Steve, you gotta fix this thing, because this is going on too long. And we'll be like, all right, all right, all right. And so then, we'll come in, reshape it, and then we'll have a show that has re recaptured that, that raw aliveness, and then also has some whimsy, and has the uh, dramaturgical, geeked out thoroughness. <laughs> Echo <Echelon>. line. <laughs> you know, another thing that's, um, if you came in to watch one of our rehearsals, you'd see Anne Bogart sitting on a big stool with a music stand and a script, looking very intensely at the stage. But in a way, uh, you'd never know that she was directing. Because, uh, as she would say, and I think this is true, that you, all of us are following the person in the moment who's got the scent as to where the thing should be going. And so the, the, the listening that we're doing is really, really intense. And, the leader can change from moment to moment to moment, and you're really just trying to track who's in charge in a given moment. It might be Darren West, our sound designer, in one moment. It might be one of the actors. It might be the dramaturg if we have one. You know, it's, so it's constantly shifting. I remember um, watching a few hours of an under construction rehearsal here. This was maybe six years ago, five years ago, and um, uh, what I caught that afternoon was there was a couple of hours worth of conversation about how I think we were going to duct tape. Stephen Weber to a poll. <laughs> and um, and what the implication, how it was going to happen and what the implications of it were, practically and dramaturgically. <laughs> and I actually remember leaving that session thinking this was one of the most incredible things I had ever seen. <laughs> Truly, the kind of listening that was going on about taping a man to a poll. Um, <laughs> or as I call it, Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> So whether I'm working at the moving company or I'm actually going somewhere else and doing a show, I have I have that muscle that, that that I have to I have to drive it. You know, I have to lead if I do, or I have to follow if I do. So um, that just sort of permeates the room. Yeah, the only difference I think when I'm directing uh, yes to all of this stuff is that there is a point, especially when I have uh, writer performers in the room, there is a point really close to act, the show actually opening where I ask them to let go of that editing part, that questioning of the writing of the material part, that we have that conversation in a really like literal way where I feel like for the, for the way that we work, the freedom <laughs> to fully have joy on stage there, they have to stop 
uh, criticizing the, the writing or the structure of the piece in that moment right before it first opens. And then later we go back and do it. But it is, uh, it is a moment where they hand, they like entrust me with the keys to that. that, that and that, that's a nice feeling on both sides, I think, to be able to take ownership of that in a different way. And then there is a little bit more of hierarchy than we have prior to it when we're building it, I think. In a moment, we're about to transition to questions. Thank you. <laughs> this is going to be my last question, then we're going to open up to a couple of questions. My last question is if you could talk a, a bit about, again, I know this is a ludicrous question with the amount of time we have, but um, change and longevity. So I'm interested in how your company has evolved over the years, <laughs> if, there's a, if there's a way to just speak to that. Um, and um, what the endeavor has been of maintaining your relationship to that company uh, creatively, professionally, practically, what keeps you with it? I'll make it quick. I, I think for us, it's a necessity. So as long as the necessity is always there, it'll keep going. Someone's going to get tired and want to stop, I'm sure. Um, but I think, and that's the beauty of an ensemble usually, why it got created, why it happens, that there's a need there to make work, whatever kind of work you're making. And I think that need is what drives us, so I think as long as that's there, it's gonna, that's what's going to let it keep going. I think um, the, the existence of the civilians is so entirely about Steve and his vision, that it's hard for me to imagine somebody else being its artistic director. I think that he is um, such a singular mind and such a singular creative force that I am very curious how it would be run by someone else, if it were to be run by someone else. Um, over time, the company has developed an infrastructure. There are, I don't know, eight or 10 people in the office now, and there used to be zero at the beginning. but. Uh, um, you know, I know there are a great many people who are connected with it. It's a much more diverse ensemble now, which is something that's totally great. And um, what keeps me wanting to keep working with the civilians, and I, I think I speak for more than a few of my fellow company members, is that uh, what we do is really fun and really provocative and exciting. I don't know that anybody else is hybridizing theater based on real people and real events in real life with this sort of highly theatrical cabaret ethos. And to me that's super unique about the civilians. And fun as hell. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah that's, it's a good lead in because The Hypocrites was started by Sean Graney and, uh, and he's a, a very unique artist and a really strong personality and a, and a you know, real famous in Chicago and a particular looking person and I think the feeling would have been that he's just a character and, I, and, a, and a visionary and, that's, and everyone in that company was there because of him, similarly, um, including me. And so I, I feel like we probably thought that that the same thing for a lot of the time, but uh, the way that I became artistic director with Granny just said I don't want to do it anymore. I wasn't in town at the time, and he, he sort of said, you come, you come back and do it, or we should call it quits. And that was a pretty big thing to say, and um, uh, we had a lot, I said no at first, because I was like, it's a terrible job to take over for Sean Graney, who would want to do that, he would fail immediately. For sure. And we had a lot of conversations about that, and the company had a lot of conversations about what the hypocrites were, like, what were we now, have we grown past just being Sean Grady's vision, we, something else, and we decided that we were, and uh, and we decided. I decided to take the slow road uh, to that, where I asked Grady to direct two shows in a season for the first few years that I took over, because I wasn't having a crew. I, we were just going to. It seemed important to stay, and that there were more voices and more interesting work to do. Uh, what kept me around was initially. We changed as Granny's interests and desires changed, it's similar to Anne, I think. And that was an exciting thing to be a part of as a performer and a, and a director, to be moving and shifting through a landscape of theater. Um, and that changed enough where I feel like we grew past his singular vision and grew to some larger uh, questions and challenges. 
theatrically, um, but there was a style and an aesthetic that stays true because we were a company that we've uh, learned to expand on, have new directors and, and new visions within that over the last five years, I feel like. So it's a pretty, we're still working on that. It's a really interesting question and way, uh, way to think about when companies are ready to change hands that have such singular <coughs> visionaries as their leaders, what do they grow into and, and do they have uh, a reason to continue? And I think if you want to be an institutional art force in your community, you, it seems important to find ways to do that. And I feel that way about the hypocrites and the community around it and all the artists that survive. So now moving forward for me is the joy of trying to support those artists, um, trying to find ways to make sure that everyone has that kind of artistic home is a fantastic job. Yeah. It's, this is the question uh, that I'm living with. Um, as I approach age 50, um, having worked with Anne since I was 20 years old, um, it, it's, it's been with me for about seven years. I can't, sorry, can't answer it because it's right there. But um, we still want to be together. We still love to make work together, even though it's getting harder physically, um, emotionally. <laughs> Um, but it's the desire to, to be together. And we'll ask Anne flat out, do you still want to do this? Do you still want to be in charge? And, you know, and she's still saying yes, so <clears throat> here we are. <laughs> um, and being on the road is kind of a drag for me now. I miss my partner, uh, my dog, a lot. <laughs> and I'm looking at 10 weeks in LA, away from New York, so that wears thin. It wears thin, but it's also, it's like a drug. It's also amazing. So, I don't know. It's hard. We have a little bit of time for a couple of questions. Questions? There's one. And also, I think we have to run a microphone. Is that right? Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, right here. Right in the front. Percy, right here in the front. And then. We'll take one over here. Thank you. Uh, Adore from San Francisco. How often do budget constraints influence your artistic endeavors, and do you have daytime jobs? <laughs> All the time, and no. Um, I mean, budget is always a question. Money's a question. We'd like more of it, um, obviously. Um, but we gotta make the work, so we do it with what we have. You know, and try to stretch that out as best we can. Sometimes actually having nothing is better. To have that constraint really helps um, the work, certain work. And then it decides for you as well. You're like, well, we can't do that show because we can't afford it. Um, and then I'm lucky enough to not have a day job, so. Um, in terms of the civilians, I would say that uh, if Steve had his brothers we would definitely have millions more dollars and be doing all the shows at once. <laughs> he's, he is a voraciously creative person and he's always got great ideas and things in development. And um, I, I will say to his great credit, Steve has always insisted on paying uh, actors on equity contracts, which many ensembles do not and could never do. Uh, so I, I really give him props for that. And it also enables him to get a wide variety of actors because Actors need jobs and they need to work and get health insurance and all that jazz. So, um, uh, I, I do have a day job. I work as a joke writer, as a comedy writer, which is a wonderful day job. It's really good. Uh, yeah, I think budget constraints should probably stop us, but it, they don't very often, um, for better or for worse. And, uh, uh, I, I teach, I teach a, a lot of theater. I, I don't make a full-time living as the artistic director of Hypocrites presently, but we're hoping to move our company towards paying artists and our staff a little better. But we do have some people who do make a living full-time as uh, staff of the Hypocrites. So we're right in between the two. Us too. Yeah. Yes? Glenn Lonely, New York Theater Bar. Uh, I forget, I came in late whether it was the citizens or the civilians. The civilians, yeah. to, Well, I don't know whether it was you, because there are a lot of these groups, normal theater of Oklahoma that do telephone calls. Uh, but the, 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 the yeah. price yeah. in Colorado, I thought that was fantastic. 
But have you ever had lawsuits, libel suits? People come to the no. theater and say, you made me look like a no. racist, sexist, homophobe? No. Never? No. Did they recognize themselves? Yeah, people always come to see themselves. And uh, those are the uh, very exciting performances for us as actors. Sometimes we've gotten notes on ourselves as characters. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we we have everybody sign contracts when they agree to be interviewed, so... You, you have know. a release. Yes. Yeah, we have people sign releases, and, um, you know, we, te we definitely honor people's feedback, but we make the shows that we make, and we don't apologize for them. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. As anybody who's been in the theater knows that not everybody's blessed enough to have somebody like Dan leading the show. Dan, somehow you always... Her influence helped make the right decision. So my, my Uber question here, working collaboratively or in other ways, risk is a two-edged sword. Getting up there and doing something to get on your heart is going to be fantastic. Pulling it off, everybody goes, wow. And then Tuesday, you get up and do it again, and it falls flat on its face. So as in a collaborative sense, does the collaboration sharpen the sword, or does it beaten the sword and kind of deft it to where it's, it's, it's not as sharp as it would be somebody who's singularly making the decision. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> I think in our case it sharpens it, uh, definitely, because there's a shared history, and that shared history is so much a part of any piece that's being made, and there's so much in collaboration about what's not said, and those are sometimes the most important moments when actually a word is not spoken, when it's just understood, where you, you, you just psychically read each other's minds. And, and that comes with being together over a period of time, and it's invaluable. And, on a very practical level, being together over a long period of time with the same people um, allows you to make work really quickly, and in this country, you have to. And we don't have the luxury of, of months and years, as was mentioned earlier. So that collaboration, the being together, allows the work to go on fast. Uh, uh, traditional playwrights are, tend to be very concerned with subsequent productions of their work. Uh, for your devised projects, how comfortable are you and what has your experience been with productions of the work beyond you that aren't handled by your own companies? Um, do you have set policies on those things? Have there been subsequent productions, and how do you feel about them? Um, in the case of Gone Missing, which is a, a civilian show that has gotten quite a lot of productions at colleges and universities and whatnot, um, I, I love it. I think it's wonderful. Um, but to me, the idea of taking a devised thing and actually just copying it is kind of not the point, although it's certainly possible and people are welcome to do it, but I think something that's more interesting is if you could say to that college or university, well, why don't you guys go out and interview, you know, build your own show, because every, everyone you interview is going to be different and have a different response, and, I, and to me, that's, that's the, the cool part of the process, is not, not making a Xerox. Uh, we work with Chuck Mia a lot, the player, he's a company member, and uh, he loves to get his work done by <laughs> Anybody. Um, and so we just have to check in with Chuck to make sure that he's not sending it out while we're still recording it. Uh, I'm not sure it's ever happened. Um, only be, uh, Not that we're against it in any way, it's just that I'm not sure it's possible. I don't think for the work that we've done or that we do, I'm not sure it's possible to say, yeah, in in the sense that it's 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 our work, and the, if, even if you if you looked at it on paper, you go, I don't, I don't know how that means, you know? um, But on the other side of that, you we like to go to universities and create shows with students as a first step to our work, and so we create a full production with them as sort of research and development, sort of, um, and so it's theirs. That is theirs. And then when, even when we do, it's much different than what we did with them. That's just the first draft, so if that answers it. You know, I just worked on a show at a university that was a neo-futurist show, so it was written by and for individuals and their names, and the script were their real names. 
And, but it was also the story of a great circus train wreck in Hammond, Indiana, and it was a really great, that part of the story is really exciting for university students to work on because there's a lot of different performance styles. And so the playwright, the main playwright, came with me there and we started to rework it to see if we could do exactly that, if it was possible to take something so particular to the original creators and turn it into something that could be opened up to a larger group. And I think it was pretty successful, but uh, regardless, it was a really great experiment trying to take new people to a piece and they, the college kids got to help us. So in a way, it was just another uh, uh, journey like similar to the original one, but I think we, we ended, we, that it recently finished, so I'm still contemplating whether or not that's a project to continue because some of these plays are amazing and they have these small lives in Chicago that I think they should have bigger lives uh, just to share them with more people and share performance styles and writing style that's, I think, unique to our city, but who knows, because we never send it outside of our, our insular world sometimes. And so I, I think it's a really great <coughs> question of can you take something so new, unique to your world and, and get it out to the rest of the country, people who I think are really interested in that, that kind of work. Yeah. I believe you have one more. Please. Hi, um, I have a question about belonging, I guess, particularly in terms of like the actors and performers. Like Colleen, you mentioned that you couldn't imagine the civilians without Steve, mm -hmm. but could you ever think like this company wouldn't exist without this performer? And also just like in companies that are open I imagine there are like different levels of belonging where someone has been like working for 15 years versus like a new collaborator. So how do you sort of like negotiate those different levels of feeling like you belong to the company? Well, I I will say that I, I don't believe in the civilians that there's you know one person who's absolutely essential as an actor because these pieces are so about everybody on stage. They're, they're definitely some of the most egalitarian performance experiences I've ever had as an actor, um, and it, which is great. And I love that. I mean, I, I'm in two different ensembles, so clearly that is my jam. But um, I, I will say that with the civilians, it requires a very special kind of actor, somebody who can be extremely um, selfless, like very shape-shifty because we play lots of different characters, so you have to have those technical chops to really transform and make it not about one's own self at all and play people really accurately, but not uh, slavishly so. And you also have to be able to be funny and entertaining and provocative, and I, I call it the Olay factor. <laughs> and it's, it's a unique sort of combination of things, and not, not all actors have it. So, that's the thing that we like about each other as actors, and I think that as Steve appreciates about us, that we don't take things super seriously, we're not very chin strokey or, uh, or self important <laughs> 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 It's a, it's, a, it's a spirit that the actor has, and if it's someone that's been at the company for 25 years, some, someone who's out of school, you know, if they have the spirit, it, it, we harness it or we let it flourish, you know what I mean? Yeah. Gotta, um, but if they don't, they don't. There are, there are OGs, yeah. grizzled veterans, veterans, and fresh faces. <laughs> we, we need fresh faces because they keep us older people inspired. Thanks so much for joining us.